I I did read the book and I really enjoyed it. I think uh, status is a it's a funny thing to write about because we're all sort of beholden to it, and the especially the people online that go, I don't even care what other people, those people are the, they're the <laughs> they're obsessed worst. with it, right? Like yeah, the more you talk yeah. about it, they're yeah, the worst. Yeah. The more you act like you don't give a crap about status, the more for sure you're obsessed with it and you think about it nonstop yeah. and lay awake yeah. at night wondering how to get more. I always think about this. People say, I don't care. I don't care what people think about me. Even saying that is a status claim because you're saying that I'm above you. I'm better than you. Cause I just don't care. You know, it is like, you so, you so care. <laughs> it, the, my favorite phrase from like the sort of gen, uh, maybe millennials are the guys, cause it's always guys that say, I just don't even give a fuck, man. I don't give a, I'm like, no, no, no. You give all of the fucks. You give so many fucks. You're talking about it right now. That's how many fucks you give. Yeah, exactly. You know, like nobody else is sitting here talking about how they don't uh, care. You're mate. You, you made a post about, you made a video about how you don't care. That's how yeah, much you yeah, care. Yeah. Um, wh why is this, you know, it, why is status just integrated into the human genome brain, whatever it is in, in, in a way that cannot be removed? Ah, well, um, that goes back to our evolutionary history. So, um, as you, I'm sure, you know, and most, most of your kind of viewers will know we're a tribal animal, you know, we're an ape that, um, worked out how to, uh, work cooperatively and, um, that involves being in groups and and working with groups and working out how to sort of cooperate in groups. Um, so so that's that that was essential for our survival. But but it wasn't simply a case of connecting into groups. Like connection is really important. We all want to be connected to people. Uh, it wasn't just that. It's actually you have to earn status within that group because the more status that you earn in that group, the more resources you get, the more food you get, the better access to mates, the safer sleeping sites. Like everything gets better as your status gets better. So that's why the book is called The Status Game, because, you know, to our subconscious mind, it is like it's playing a game, you know, in all the groups that we join in life, whether it's a, you know, sports team or a, uh, it's, it's our job or, a, you know, it's the podcast game against the rival podcast players. You know, we're playing a game um, uh, of status. And, and, and so, so it's this, our subconscious minds has this kind of basic instruction, join groups, gain status because in that way we maximize our potential for survival and reproduction so it goes that far down into the core of our humanity you know it really is fundamental it's the way we play at life but it also pushes us to innovate and achieve right because it's almost like the reason i work well not the whole reason I'd like to think, but one of the main reasons why I'm like, okay, I got to market the Jordan Harbinger show. And it's like, I want to make impact, but that's also like, well, I want more people to know about it and I want them to use it. And I want them to credit it with them getting a raise at work or changing their life. And I want better guests and I want to do a better job on this show as a host, because let's be real. If we get down to the base level, this has to do with status. I want people to listen. It raises my rank in the Spotify and then more people find, it, you know, and then I get more advertisers because they associate me with more people and more uh, of a beneficial brand. So I get money because of that, which also raises my status, which makes me able to raise my kids and send them to better schools. I mean, like every thing that, that I do, status. whether yeah. you admit it or not, right. And it raises their status, right. Which <laughs> yeah. is like my yeah. genes are now high status yeah. down the yeah, line absolutely. because yeah. I, had a good conversation with Will Store. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it turns out to be way more important than any of us really want to admit. And it's like you even think the most wholesome thing you can think of, like doing a good job at, as, as a teacher, there's still status involved in that. Now, it might not be the main thing and it might not be the thing you think about, but it's it's there. And it's like anybody who says that it's not there is 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 lying to themselves, at, at least to themselves, probably to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think I think the, one of the main takeaways from doing all the research for me was that you're right. We, we, we don't like to admit that we were interested in our own status. It, it kind of makes us feel a bit grubby because um, uh, we tell this heroic story about ourselves. Like, I just want to you know, I want to change the world. I want to help people and all these kinds of things. Um, so so we, we, we kind of swallow our desire for status. Uh, but but I think for, for how I've started to think about it is, is you know, you have this, you know, when you think about it, you think, well, it's just status. But actually, it's the just I don't really agree with. Status is really, really important. And, you know, and and dismissing it as, oh, it's just status is is to, is to fundamentally misunderstand the human condition. You know, we seek connection and we seek, and we seek <clears throat> status. 
And that's, that's not a bad thing. It's a really good thing. And one of the things I do in the, in, in the book is I delineate three kinds of different status game that people tend to play. There, there are dominance games. So we've been playing dominance games um, for millions of years. And Anim- most animals, uh, you know, play dominance games. And that's physical. That's fear, strength. So that's a one kind of status. Another kind of status is virtue. You know, and part of our being a mm-hmm. tribal species is that we would compete to be seen as virtuous, generous, putting the tribe first. And you can see that in the storytelling of you know thousands of years. Um, heroes in stories are ones that put the tribe first, ones that put their own, they, 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 they put their own interests behind and the interests of the people that they care about in front. That's a hero. Um, and then there's success, you know, competence. We, you know, when we're evolving, being a competent um, honey finder, a competent storyteller, a competent, you know, tuba digger. Um, this was really good and really useful to the tribe. So again, we've evolved to um, attach uh, status to competence. And so, so you know, in your your game as a, as a podcaster, that that's driving you. I want to be a better podcaster. You know, you've got the you've been talking to me about how the, the software that you've got is the best software. It's much better than all those other bits of software yeah. <laughs> for the podcast that I've been before. Right. And I've no doubt that I've it's no true. doubt that that's, I've no doubt that that's true. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's all part of the status game. So, 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 so you can see dismissing it as just status. No, the status is driving you to be a better man, a better person, more competent, more successful. And that is a, that is a gift to the world. That is an entertainment to all of your listeners. That is a gift to your family who are supported by your work. And in, in, in the broader view, you know, it's, it's taken Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson to, to the edge of space this week, this drive for status, who's going to be the first? And these are fantastic things, you know, I, I, you know, the need for status, whether it's competence or um, success based status or virtue based status, it, it, all of the good that's done in the world uh, is based on this strivings that people have for status. It it seems to be an important look, it's an important driver. We've kind of covered this, but it also it seems to be that there's almost like an appropriate, like a societally appropriate level of striving for status. So, for example, uh, I'd like to think that I fall into the category of like normal people seeking status for the quote unquote right reasons and in the right way. Right. Be really good at your craft. Help people out as much as you can, uh, both because it makes me feel good, but also because then I'm seen as an authority in this area and then blah, 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 advertising and dollars. We kind of talked about that before, Um, but not just the I don't think the more I can shove mattresses down people's throats in this podcast, the more of a bigger car I'm going to get. But you see when sort of like the influencer bullshit goes wrong, right, where you see people on Instagram and they're doing all of this very bizarre stuff to seek status where you just think, okay, this is a little bit over the line, right? They're not using it to make a better show for their listeners. They're using it specifically and solely to make themselves look good. And usually that involves showing other people what they lack compared to that person. And then, and and that's kind of where it gets toxic, right? Where you're creating FOMO and, and almost downgrading other people's status intentionally or otherwise in order to bring yours up. And that I think is where it starts to get a little bit objectionable. Uh, and, and we can talk about this because in your book, you mentioned that status is is relative, right? So decreases in our own earnings, if we're just gonna talk about money, they have a detrimental effect, but a raise in my neighbor's standings have that same effect, even if my earnings are unchanged. And I think this probably, so, so status is relative, right? But it causes all sorts of problems, I would assume. Uh, I would assume this causes more problems because look, instead of earning more money, I can just move to an area where everyone else has less. That's sort of a weird solution. But the other thing I can do is make other people look or feel like they have less and make myself look or feel like I have more, which I think we can all see where that can go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's absolutely right. And and, and I think a lot of the uh, the toxicity that we see developing in internet culture and have have, have been seeing in, in developing in internet culture since the rise of social media um, uh, is a result of this of this kind of relentless status driving, and I, and you know since I've done the research, I, I you know I used to have this kind of reflexive. You blame Jack from Twitter and you know Mark Zuckerberg for for it all, and of course they've not helped. You know, um, but uh, I, you you you're never going to get get rid of it because if you're connecting human beings together, so be together 
they're going to play the status game. And sometimes that's going to get really rough. And, you know, one of the things I do in the book is I go back to the very first, the, the early days of um, social media, which is go back to the 80s, the mid 80s. And um, the, the, probably the first social media website, as we'd recognize it today, was called The Well. And, um, uh, and you could only get on it by, you know, it was like the film War Games where they put the phone on the modem and it, it, had, to, it had to dial in. Um, and there was only sort of, you know, but it, it got to this, you know, about 500 regular users and the first internet troll turns up and starts attacking them all. Um, and they have, it. you know, it's incredible how little things have changed. They are having rows about pronouns that are exactly the same as the rows we're having about pronouns today. Like, literally, um, they were doing this. And so you can see it doesn't take Mark Zuckerberg or Jack, the Twitter dude, um, to create this toxicity. It just creates connecting people together and just setting them free. And they'll start trying to boost their own status, trying to drop off other people's status, and that's going to become toxic. And you're going to get these this cancel culture that we're seeing today it's, I, you know, it's in our human nature. It's, it's, you know, it's what we've done with the internet. So status gives us meaning in many ways, and it's as, as necessary as oxygen or water from what it sounds like. Uh, you mentioned, you start off the book actually with this, this story of a prisoner named Ben. This was a fascinating example. I have to hand it to you to start with, because usually when we think status, we think rock star or athlete that's up on top and goes down and then gets depressed about it. This is a guy who I, I think he'd done something really horrible, like murdered another child or something like this as a young man. Uh, tell me about Ben, because this sort of shows us that no environment and no person is really exempt from this. Yeah, well, Ben, Ben, ben is somebody that I met um, uh, quite a few years ago now, back in my days when I was still doing journalism. And he, he's a fascinating man. And so, yeah, I, that, I wanted to start the book there for exactly that reason. Um, ben was somebody who lost his rag. Um, uh, again, it was a status thing. He he told another child, he was a child, he was 14, I think, and this other boy was 11, told the 11 year old the secret. And he was, and, and, he, and, he, and as soon as he told this 11 year old this secret about himself, he was panicked. He thought, oh my God, if, if the world gets to know about this, um, I'm, I'm, they're going to laugh at me. It's going to be humiliation. So he lost his temper and he, he attacked him and, 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 and this, this kid ended up dead and, and Ben um, went to prison um, for that um, as a, as a schoolboy, um, And, you know, so that's where his life was. He was just had nothing. And, 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 and he was, you know, as this happens in prisons all over the world, he was bullied and victimized by the um, prison officers. Uh, he tried to kill himself by starving himself, uh, tried to escape. That didn't work. Um, uh, but eventually he kind of picked himself up. And what he started doing was he started researching the law um, and he started sort of pushing back against the prison guards, uh, against what he perceived as these great injustices. And then he started helping other prisoners and he became known as this kind of jailhouse lawyer kind of guy. And, and, and so um, he, he, he began playing this kind of game of status, which he which he, which he you know, which he kind of called um, uh, um, uh, fighting abuses of justice, I think. And, and um, what happened was um, he kept coming up for parole. And um, every time he, he um, came up for parole, he, there'd be some misdemeanor that he'd get wrong and he'd get ref refused parole. And he ended up being, I think, the the, the longest, the, the person who is who served in Britain longest over their kind of tariff, um, and uh, and I think he was in there for like thirty years in the end. And and what happened was he fell in love. He fell in love with a visiting English teacher, and they they just fell head over heels. They were having sex in the stationery cupboard, and he was you know phoning her on this secret phone and all this stuff. And um, you, you know, it was all there waiting for him. Literally, all he had to do was behave, and he he could leave prison. He could move in with his Alex and into their beautiful, you know, um, cottage. This is a place called the Cotswolds in in England, where all the rich people live. Like fabulous place, you know. When you think of England at its best, it's the Cotswolds. And he 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 just wouldn't do it. Uh, and he eventually kind of had to admit to her, you know, well, I don't want to leave. And and so I thought that was really interesting. Why didn't he want to leave? You know, he he'd lost everything. And um and I think it was this status, you know, he, he, he'd he found a status game to play. And he, he said to me, you know, I was a lifer and that gives you a certain status in prison. And I was this jailhouse lawyer. So I was the guy who was fighting back. And um, and indeed, eventually what, what enabled him to leave prison was Alex got him to start up a blog called Prisoner Ben, where he would sort of um, uh, talk about his um, life in prison. And that blog became really successful. It won an Orwell Prize, very prestigious. So only when he managed to get a bit of status on the outside world would he leave. 
but even then it wasn't enough and he had this huge um collapse uh um you know because he he just didn't have he, he he spent his life creating this status game and he excelled at it. And then as soon as he kind of left it, he, he collapsed. And if you now look up Ben Gunn, you'll find him on Twitter very easily. And he's now um, this big Twitter warrior that's constantly <laughs> rowing with people and having fights. He's one of these, was one of these types. Um, but, you know, you can see this is, this, this is how he plays for status. And, and so, yeah, I, I thought that was a really fascinating, a fascinating kind of experiment in a way, like a one man experiment. What do you do? What happens when somebody is thrown into hell in prison where they've got no status whatsoever? They're a child killer. They've got no status whatsoever. Well, you, 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 you find status that if you're, if you, if you're got a healthy brain, you find status. If you don't want to collapse, that's what you do. There's a connection between low status and depression. I would love to touch on this because Anything that sort of explains why depression exists, I think, is almost helpful for people that deal with it because you just, instead of thinking your brain is broken, you just realize it's in a mode that's not serving you. Um, this doesn't go for all depression, obviously, but I'd love to, for you to shed a little light on this. Yeah, so there's a very strong link between depression and suicide and um, lo lack or loss of status. Um, one of the ideas um, is that when is that you know when we become depressed, it's because we. Um, we're doing badly in the game, you know, we're failing to find status. Um, and um, the, 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 because status is such a fundamental need, you know, when we, when we feel we're lacking in status to the subconscious kind of evolved brain, that signals, well, we're doing badly in this tribe, we're going to start losing resources, we're going to start losing security. And so what happens is we kind of, you know, move to the back of the cave, as it, as it were, and, and shelter and we, 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 we lose we, 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 the, the, the mind's trying to stop us going into battle with higher status people because it's, it's too dangerous out there. Um, so, and um, uh, when people study the causes of suicide, again, you know, an incredibly complex subject. It's not as simple as people have lost status. But certainly in a lot of cases, um, that's what is found. It's people who um, have, you know, lost significant amounts of status. And, and I think the people who are, um, most vulnerable often are the ones who've lost the most status rapidly. This is why I think Jeffrey Epstein did kill himself because he's just a, just a textbook example of somebody who was up here and went down there with enormous rapidity. Um, so I, you know that's why I suspect he, that I don't believe these conspiracies that it was a it was a fit up. He's just a classic case of somebody that you could expect to to take their own lives. Um, so yeah, so, so, uh, so, so that and that's what they find. So so, so it's when people kind of rapidly, you know, lose lose status. It's why um, the financial crisis. Lots of people ended up committing suicide. Um, yeah. So, so again, it's incredibly important. You know, when we, when when the and also when we're left behind, it, it, people become vulnerable to suicidal ideation. Um, so when we stay still and all our friends and everybody around us accelerates on. It, that could be very bad for our mental health. And again, as you say, it's not because there's anything wrong with us. It's because our brains are functioning correctly. They, 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 our brains are are putting us into an emergency mode because when we lack status, that's that's a dangerous situation for the human animal to be in. I want to sort of clarify this too. The plenty of super successful people struggle with depression as well. So I don't want people to think like, "Oh, I have depression." Does that also mean I'm low status? Like, <laughs> F, you know, screw no, me. No. What the hell? This sucks. You know, like I I want to clarify that there are many reasons for it. Yeah, and and of course, status is relative. I mean, one 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 of the one of the sort of the the, the dangerous things about status is that that we acclimatize to it very easily. So you know, we become this person and you know it's great for a while and then but after a while we acclimatize we want the next thing we want the next thing and we want the next thing and i think that's the interesting thing about super successful people is that is that is that from our lowly heights you can look up at them and go wow you must be so happy but of course we know they're not happy <laughs> often they're not happy because status is relative they're looking at the people around them and going well you know, Jeff Bezos is looking at Branson and going, well, you've got to space before me. <laughs> you know, that's annoying, you know, perhaps. Um, and so so they're playing a game. You know, we play status games with the, with the people cl closest to us. We don't play status games with distant people so much. We don't compare ourselves um, very often to the King of Thailand or Michelle Obama. You know, if we did, we'd be very unhappy because we're not those people and we're never going to be those people. That's a form of kind of torture. We compare ourselves to the people around us. So, so the, so people that you would consider high status are just as vulnerable to these, to these mental health issues than people who would consider low status because 
um, they're comparing themselves to the people around them. You know, so for a super wealthy person to suddenly live my life with my income, they could become seriously mentally ill, <laughs> as insulting as that is to me. But that's it's the truth. You know, right. you, you know you, that that that's how it works. That's 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 how human cognition works. Yeah, it is kind of sad. I, I feel bad for the guy who has to move into my house, which is probably the size of his, you know, 12 car garage. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's like yeah. no one in their right mind would feel bad for the hedge fund manager that's forced to downgrade into a 6,000 square foot or whatever house, you know, house. And, and they only have two swimming pools. Not that I have this, by the way, but like they're, oh my gosh, there's another house in front of you before you get to the beach, you poor thing. Right. Like this is, this is all relative. Yeah, that, but that's the craziness of it. Nobody in their right minds would feel sorry for that hedge fund manager, but he would be suffering mm -hmm. every. He would be suffering sincerely and genuinely, not because he chooses to, because that's the that's the human brain. You know, like I'm a fairly you know middle middle class, I'd say, and if I always suddenly had to go and live in a, a, a house that, that that is significantly below where I'm living now, I would be uh, feeling uh, you know depressed and oh my god this life is not worth living which is incredibly insulting to the people who are very happily living in those kinds of houses now there's it's not you've got to to, un, to remove that kind of the, the, the urge to morally judge people on this stuff because it doesn't work you know and equally you know the the, the people who are living in those houses are living in in a kind of splendor that 100 years ago they've got running water television electricity you know they can turn lights on and off this is like they're living a by, by the standards of 100 years ago fantastic amazing lives you know working class people in their homes but they would you know so so it's all it's all relative and and i think that's uh it, as weird as it sounds it's given me a new kind of empathy for super successful people i don't um wish i was them quite so much anymore because i understand that that they experience the same pain as anybody else, and e even though, as you say, nobody feels sorry for them, they still hurt, and they st because because they because it's all relative. It's the ones in the public eye that have it the worst, right? Because you look mm -hmm. at somebody like Kim Kardashian, and you think this person's getting so rich, they have so many things going for them. There's all this and that, but they're looking at like you said, Beyonce or Michelle Obama, and they're like, man, how do I get to that level? I don't understand what's going on. And they're thinking, I didn't get invited to the red carpet at the Grammys this year. Does that mean that my status is lower? Meanwhile, I've never shed a tear over not being invited to the Grammys or the Oscars, <laughs> or I, and I will never do that, yeah. right? And, and you, I assume, are in the same boat. You know, there's nothing that says, I can't believe I didn't get invited to the inauguration this year. That's ridiculous. What does this well, mean for my life? Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and but, but but I've got my own, but I've got my own things that 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 um you know if if I if I think about the situation I'm in now, how it looks from when I was a schoolboy failing all my exams and just being hated by other teachers, I'd be thinking, wow. You must be so happy. You, you you write books for a living. You're invited onto these podcasts to talk about your ideas. You know, you're comfortably off. This must be amazing. And of course, it's not amazing because <laughs> I'm just thinking, well, you know, how come I'm not on Rogan yet? And, and you know, that, 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 you know, it's like, you, 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 that, I mean, everyone is like this. This is the, this is, this is human life. This is the status game. It's the, it's what we all do. And we drive ourselves crazy with these, the, the, these, the, these things which rationally and objectively are pointless you know they're, they're, they're symbolic they're, they're nothing and yet they, they they're not they mean everything to us and and if sometimes it can feel um demeaning to it to admit it but but you've only got to be honest with yourself and it's true start talking about how aliens built the pyramids and how atlantis is real <laughs> and uh start doing psychedelics and you have a much better shot at getting on rogan i'm just going to give you a couple <laughs> pro tips there um <laughs> That's that's how you get on that show. Uh, you know, if 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 this book doesn't do it, but you know, oh, interesting. I was invited on in the, the book but as the well. Corona, um, I couldn't go because the the virus. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had the date fixed and everything, and oh, it was a March oh, last man. year. You should definitely. know. You should definitely go. You should stop wasting your time with shows like this and go on Joe Rogan immediately. No, no. Get over there. Get get that. Uh, wear one of those space helmets so that you're, uh, you know, not affected by the virus. You know, one of those ventilated ones that have like the 
Do it. It's it's uh, Joe Rogan would you know you you then you're gonna hit the list. Then those teachers that thought you were an idiot back in elementary school are gonna be like, wow, Will Store, well, man, he turned around, he turned it around. But then it'll be the next thing and the next thing. I mean, it's the treadmill, isn't it? Well, yeah. Yeah, you'll be like, why can't I get on? Uh, well, I guess Rogan's probably one of the top for for any author. But you're gonna then wonder why you didn't get invited to the White House or something like that. Yeah. Oh God, I, I, I hope I never get like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. People will often get accept a, a higher status job title versus a pay raise, and I thought this was interesting, right? Because that sort of says, hey, status is worth more than money in many cases. Now, money is status in many cases as well, but it, it just sort of. That sort of proves in many ways that status that's very visible and obvious to everyone around you who you're competing with, it might even be better than a raise, right? Because if I get a raise by five or 10 grand, maybe other people in my office don't even know. Maybe it's confidential, but everyone's going to know if I get promoted to Sir Jordan Harbinger intergalactic podcaster, MD, PhD, <laughs> right? They're going to be like, whoa, okay. He really got, the boss thinks a lot of him. The committee thinks a lot about him. They don't necessarily know that I got a salary bump. Well, that's it. Yeah. I mean, and this is one of the surprising things is that when, when, when they do surveys, they usually find that, that, that a good chunk of people um, would, 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 would forego a pay rise for a, a job title rise. Um, so, so, so you see, yeah, and that shows again the the importance of status and you mentioned before the, the, the that extraordinary study that the economists did where they 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 they, they, they looked at um people's relative income well firstly what they find people find that relative income uh, makes us happier than raw income so 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 what makes us happy isn't the the amount of money we get itself it's the amount of money we get versus the people around us so so, so that's that, that's what's connected to happiness not not raw cash uh, and the extraordinary study that the economists did where they found that um, uh, it, 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 if you're kind of relatively poor in the, it, 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 in your neighbourhood, you're going to be relatively kind of more uh, uh, depressed and unhappy with your life. Your, your well-being is going to be lower. And, and, and that works. Even, and, the, and the effect is greater the more you socialise in your neighbourhood. So the more you're hanging out with your rich neighbours, the less happy you are. So, 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 so it really is a powerful thing, and it, and it kind of makes sense. I, you know, we, we we we're born into this world in which, especially in you know in the US and the UK, money, 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 money. You know, it's we we're kind of led to think that money is the be all and end all, and 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 money makes the world go round. But but when we when our brains evolved, there was no money. You know, um, really, money is just a, another way of playing the status game, and you know, our, our brains are not. Um, uh, it, it didn't evolve to to want money. They they evolved to want status, and and so that's so it, so it's just another way that we, um, th th that we play that game. And at, at one one of the uh, another sort of paper that I thought was fascinating that I quote at length in the book, was by this um uh, this U.S. Uh, lawyer, big firm, former big firm firm lawyer, now a judge, and he and he writes in amazing detail about um uh, the, the process of corruption that that ju that junior kind of lawyers go through and that, uh, and that they and he writes that basically you know you join your big your big your 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 big name law firm and in two or three years you're going to become corrupted you're going to start lying and cheating as a matter of course and he says it happened to me i did it and and, and the reason for that is that is that um, you, you're going to be introduced to this world in which you're comparing yourself on the basis of money to all the other all the other lawyers, and mm -hmm. and, and 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 twice a year the legal um, uh, magazines post you know, league tables of what everyone's earning, and everyone gets obsessed with these things. Um, and the thing about lawyers is they work just incredibly hard. They work they work um, every hour, God sends, and 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 more. You know, um, so, so so how do you get the edge? And so the only way you can really get the edge is by Billing for billing for more hours than you've actually worked by making sure that um, you know sometimes not cooperating with the discovery process, making sure documents you know go missing and stuff. And, and he says this this becomes such so kind of such kind of part of second nature that that that, that it's just this inevitable process that happens for for, for young lawyers. Um, and and he he says there's a line something something about you, you, in a, in a, in, a, in a two or three years you go from somebody being really genuinely happy about being able to afford the, your first car stereo to somebody furious that you've only got a four hundred thousand dollar bonus you know that's what happens to you and so that shows the power of the status game 
you know, and it, uh, just this idea that, that 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 money is just a way we keep scoring that game. That that that's what money is. You know, uh, it, it's uh, a once proxy, we've got right? enough to yeah, once we've got enough to survive and raise our children safely and feed ourselves, it, it, the rest of it is just the status game. Uh, and it also shows the power that the game has to corrupt. You know, I thought it was a very interesting, you know, paper because it just shows how easily the, 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 the need for status can kind of nudge us into becoming, you know, l- less ethical people. Would you send that to me? I'm very interested in that. I, I used to be, uh, well, I still am an attorney and I worked on Wall Street. So I saw, I had a front row seat to all of that, right? It was like, even when I was in law school, I was like, oh my God, they're going to pay us 30 grand to come in for the summer and eat like ribs and shellfish. This is ridiculous. And then after yeah. year one, I'm like, I can't believe I'm making this much. This is more than my parents made put together at the peak of their career. It's my first year. This is so amazing. Second year, it was like, I got a bonus on top of a raise. This is incredible. And then as I started, well, I left the law pretty early, but I remember thinking like, why are these guys who are seven, eight years, nine years in so miserable? It doesn't make any sense. You have two houses, you have a boat, your kids go to a private school. You know, none of this makes any sense. And it's because another guy or gal that they went to school with is making a little bit more at an investment bank, or they move to a different firm, which, you know, we're on lockstep pay, so everyone knows what everyone's making. I know that they're making 20 grand more than me. Who cares? It will not improve your quality of life, that $20,000. There's nothing you could buy that would make you happy with it. You're going to invest it, hopefully. It's not even going to let you retire any earlier at your current level of consumption, but it's driving you crazy and you're here on sunday night missing your kid's birthday working on something that's not urgent because you want to make sure you hit your billable hours so that you get promoted to partner so that you can do that rat race i mean it just none of it really makes any sense but it all makes sense when you look at status yeah and one of the things he does in his papers is he looks you know he 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 takes on the idea that you know money makes you happy and he just talks about the, the the rates of mental ill health cocaine addiction divorce amongst big firm lawyers and it's off the charts these people are not happy they're not happy people they're really rich they're really successful but by and large they're stressed and anxious and unhappy because they're sucked into that game and and i think by nature attorneys lawyers are very competitive people you know if if you've been through law school you're smart Mm -hmm. and you're competitive so so you've got probably on average you know everybody's got a different need for status and I think you're probably you're probably up there on the on the need for status if you if you've put yourself through all that. It gets worse though, right? It gets worse when you get there because you're you're almost like I've ascended the top of the mountain when you get there. But then, like you said, you acclimate, and then it starts to become like, well, why am I at the bottom of this? Why isn't our firm paying us like this other firm does? Oh, well, they work like a sweatshop. Well, I'm a hard worker. I don't mind working on Saturdays. I feel like I'm working half the Saturdays anyway. Maybe I should switch over there. And then it's, well, all right, now you're working seven days a week. So, I yeah, I'd love to see that paper. I wonder, how do children spot and identify who to imitate and learn from, right? Who, where are children coming into this and learning about status they have to be learning it from somewhere yeah well again so, so because this is so deeply rooted in us we're born with this kind of basic instructions you know the, the, it's the wiring is there in the brain and and so um there are various cues that we look for when we're when we're children um uh, and well and, and indeed adults but, but, but these are kind of built into us um, the first one is we look for uh, we, we, we so, so, so the first thing to say is that when we're playing the status game, what we're doing is we're spotting higher status people and we're copying them. We, we mimic them. And this is why fandoms happen. This is why people take on the kind of reading and musical tastes of their idols and, their, and copy their dress, you know, because they're that, that that's that's that, 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 that that's part of who we are. That's part of the game playing cognition. You know, we, we, we spot people in our game that we admire that are high status and we copy them and we copy them because that's our strategy for becoming high status ourselves. I mean, it's a basic heuristic. I'm going to do what they're doing, whatever they're doing. I'm going to do it. So there are four. There are four. There are four cues that we um, that we use. Let me see if I can remember them. The first one is um, self similarity. So we look for people who are similar age, uh, same gender, um, and so, you know whatever whatever other kind of similarity cues there are. And of course, this is uh, has lots of unpleasant side effects. The self similarity um, cue is is obviously. Um, very uh, present in, in when we think about um, racism, 
sexism, all the isms, you know, the self, the self similarity cue is we feel more comfortable with people like us. Um, and we do from, from, you know, from birth, babies who can't speak prefer uh, to, uh, to be with people who are have the same dialect as their mother's accent, you know, it's in us, unfortunately. So the so self similarity is the first one. Um, the second one is uh, uh, competence. We, we look for people who are um, uh, are showing that they know, that they are good at tasks, and so so that that that, that draws us. Um, the third one um, is uh, we look at people who um, are so self similarity, um, competence, and then it's um, we 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 look at who other people are paying attention to. So that's another cue. So if lots of people are looking at one person, then we assume that that must, person must know something that we need to know. So we go and look at them too. And this can become a runaway effect. So um, again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's natural to us. If we, if we uh, admire them and want to become like them, you know, we have to identify with them. We, we'll pay attention to them too. And uh, they, so, so psychologists call this the Paris Hilton effect because it can, it can, it can run away. And, mm-hmm. and it, 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 these, these processes are built for small groups that we evolved in, not for... The, the age of the internet and celebrity and you know international media so so these days somebody like paris hilton who has no observable talent uh, can become hugely globally famous because everyone's just looking at them and then they get written about and then so we look at them more and they you know so, so, so that's you know that's part of the status game and then finally uh, it, um one of the cues is is we, we look at the person themselves and see how they're presenting so there are various cues that high status people use you know their head they, 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 you know, they, they head go up, they'll talk more. Um, uh, so, 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 you know, high status people tend to present in certain ways. So that will also cue us to be drawn to certain people and, and begin copying them. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to the show. Right. You mentioned in the book that certain there's some high status behaviors. And I I remember when I used to teach this kind of thing, these don't always work out perfectly well, but high status people tend to talk more. They tend to talk more loudly. They might have louder fashion, so to speak, or more of a unique and sort of zany fashion. Their vocal pitch can be different. They take up more physical space, but not too much where they look like they're trying just a lot more than the average person. Um, and they might own stuff, right? And this is this is kind of the toddler example is like uh, toddlers are really, they're not subtle about the way that they try and gain status and they can't talk. So they will hoard toys or they will grab things. They don't want to share it. Um, adults tend to be a little bit different, um, uh, with their ownership of things, but we certainly see it. I mean, how many people do you know we, we've in Hollywood where I used to live, there are directors that are unmarried or they have adult children and they have one wife and they have like a 28,000 square foot house. They live in three of those rooms. They're never home. They work in their <laughs> office. What do yeah. you need that house for? <laughs> status, yeah. right? That's all it is. They got to well, we the that they never even the- look at because they... Yeah. yeah, we have the same thing with right. the old British aristocrats in their massive castles, and then you, you find out, oh, we just live in mm-hmm. the we just live in three rooms on the in the east wing, and everything else is just full of right. you know armor and tapestries. It's, it's entirely pointless. Yeah, this is uh, th- that's funny. I can imagine that that's probably true, right? A giant manor, and it's like there's a door that n- never gets open, and the rest of the house isn't heated, but in there is like old wagons and paintings and like, yeah. I don't know, a bunch of, yeah, like you said, suits of armor with the knights standing up <laughs> yeah, in the corner, like yeah, stuff you yeah. see in a haunted house in yeah, the United States. Yeah, some ghosts um, just hanging that around. stuff's all yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, just ghosts and the occasional caretaker to make sure the rats aren't eating the ancient <laughs> tapestries and rugs from your great, yeah. great, great grandfather, you know, Lord, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. Different types of status, though, right? Dominant leaders versus prestige leaders. This is interesting because I think a lot of us, we look at apes and we look at dominant status, right? And we look at kind of like, I would say more, what's the word I'm looking for that's politically correct here? You you kind of see, not politically correct, but non-offensive, I guess, right? You see some, some sort of, there are elements of culture, especially in the United States, where let's say like big gorilla-ish type guys will use dominance games to get status and it works especially within their sort of tier and i don't play that game because i'm five foot ten and a hundred and you know 78 pounds or whatever right or on a good day you know with my shoes on i'm, I'm that tall 
I can't do that, but I can out... I, there's a different status game that I play that actually I think works a little bit better, which is, you know, I use other things that work for me, like intelligence or success in other areas um, and leadership and things like this. So dominance versus prestige, these are two different types of status games. Most are being played at some level almost at the same time and in the same place. Yeah, so, so that's it. So, so um, as I said, dom dominance games is the oldest is the oldest form of game and... and, and, and it, um, it's more typical in the, in the you know it's, it's very typical in the animal world so the you know the idea that the chickens will peck at each other until a pecking order is established um crayfish you know attack each other until they've worked out who's it, who, who's in this order so dominance is, is is very animalistic and uh before we settled down into our tribes uh, you know humans were um much more um into dominance games fighting very violently one-on-one -on -one. i mean dominant, this is males um particularly we you know and our bone structures were different we had much more muscle mass we you know we were much more aggressive um before we settled down um but when we settled down you know all these alpha males going around beating each other to death you know or near to death it wasn't going to work when we were all trying to live communally so so, so what happened was uh, we evolved different forms of um status game and these aren't unique to humans. You know, the more intelligent animals also use prestige. Um, but, but the idea is that rather than having a fight one on one to show who was on top, you would um, you, you would earn prestige. So, so you would play um, a status game with your reputation rather than the actual self. So, so the important thing is that people thought well of you. And there are two ways of earning prestige in, in, in a group. And, and, and the first one is virtue. So the idea that, 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 that you're useful to the that, that, that what they both have in common is that you're useful to the group. And the more useful you are to the group, the more status you're awarded, the more heroic people think you are. Um, so, so there are two ways of being useful to your group, your tribe. And the first one is being virtuous, enforcing the tribe's codes, um, making sure everyone's taking part in their rituals or, be, or, or and indeed, you know, taking part in the rituals yourselves, um, believing its sacred beliefs. Um, uh, being generous, uh, being courageous in fights, in uh, hunting. So that's virtue. And then there's success. So competence. So, so, so you know, you're also being very useful to your um, tribe if you're uh, very knowledgeable and very skillful. So, so those are the three essential status games. And there are, there are other ways we can earn status. Beauty is a way of earning status. Age is a way of earning status. Height is a way of earning status. Um, but they're not mm -hmm. particularly interesting. You know, the th the, most of human life takes up these three forms of dominance, virtue, and success and, and the easiest way to understand it you know because it is that is that if we if we want status we can try and be Idi Amin, mother Teresa, or um albert einstein you know these were all people who are incredibly high status people and they earned their status through dominance in the case of Idi Amin, virtue in the case of mother Teresa, and um success in the in in, in, the, in the case of albert einstein so so it kind of the the games we play form the kind of people that we are that's interesting. I, I, I've noticed this on the kind of the, on the other side of the coin as well, that we love to see people taken down a peg, right? We love to see celebrities uh, just take a fall. We love those, the video you, you mentioned in the book, we love those videos where someone's like, do you know who I am? And like, I'm going to get you fired. And then like the cut to them getting arrested for something. I mean, look at the college admission scandal, right? We're pissed off that those people bribed their kids way into college, but we're also kind of like, oh, Aunt Becky from Full House is going to jail? Good. Not that I ever had anything against her, but like, if you're going to be a shitty person and you're famous and you're rich, I want to see you behind bars. I want to see you crying in the media, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't, ha I don't need a brain scan to know that I'm petty as hell, but I know that, that, that something's lighting up in there when that happens, right? If I'm in an fMRI machine or whatever, I know that when I see that stuff, there's a part of my brain that I almost wish wasn't there that is just having a field day. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, you know, and and that's for a couple of reasons. The first one is, as I say, you know, we, we, the, the the game is a is is an artifact of our kind of tribal uh, background, and in and in those tri in our in in the in the tribal days when our when when these parts of our brains were evolving, um, you, that virtue game, uh, it, part of that virtue game is punishing people who uh, are breaking the rules of the tribe, are being selfish, unfair. Um, and and so we've evolved to feel good about punishing them. You know, we 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 feel like we are statusful. We you know we earn status by punishing them because that's useful to the tribe. 
Um, but there's something else that's going on there too, which is the whole tall poppy thing. Uh, and I think um, it, it, it's exacerbated by the modern world because, you know, as I said, the, the, these tribes that we evolved in were, 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 were pretty small and, and we'd spend most of our um, time with 25, 30 people and those sort of little units would connect into larger groups um, at certain times. But 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 they were much smaller. We 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 had no concept of the of other people in the world. Um, there was you know back in the days of of the tribes, there there weren't any millionaires, there weren't any landowners. That you know we we were comparing ourselves to somebody who had slightly more state. You know the, some of the leaders of the tribe who had marginally more status than us. So 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 we've evolved to 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 play these very small status games. What's happened is that we now play enormous status games, massive status games. People can become massively wealthy, massively famous, and that's that's not how we we we're designed to live. So 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 and and part of the one ramification of that is that is that we have this we, we we're constantly needled by these very high status people, um, and you know sometimes we 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 love them and we love them if they if we identify with them. So if we're a big golf fan, we might love Tiger Woods, but most of the time. Um, we hate them. We really don't like them at all because they remind us how small we are. Status is, as I say, status is relative. You know, our status, it does, it's not in a fixed po- place. It, 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 depending on who we're with and who we're thinking about, it's bouncing around all over the place. And so, yeah, the other thing that's going on in the college admission, college admission scandal is that we just love seeing these people who are much more statusful than us become much less statusful than us. It's pleasurable. You know, it's 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 not necessarily a a lovely part of the human condition, but it's an undeniable one, I, I think. It's but it's also like, look, back in the caveman era, or the, even the tribal tribal era, we would be self policing, right? I'm not. I don't really hate Aunt Becky. I kind of, at some level, understand why she did what she did. I almost, I, and I have a level of pity for somebody who gets embarrassed on an international level. It sucks. But there's that other part of my brain that's like, yeah, you follow those rules, right? That everyone else that that you're breaking. Um, we all have to follow it. How dare you? Right. But this makes sense because if I'm living in a group of a hundred, 150 or a couple hundred people and somebody gets too big for their britches, I'm going to gang up on them and take them down a peg. I don't need to exile them or banish them to death or throw them in prison, but I'm certainly going to, uh, the example you give in the book is there are songs that tribes will sing. If somebody is a hunter and they're doing really well, uh, they're supposed to downplay their success and other hunter, hunters will do that. And if they don't sort of voluntarily do that, then everyone gets in their face and sings the equivalent <laughs> song of, of the opposite of the happy birthday song. Right. Where it's yeah, like, it's we're it's making fun of, of you derision. for being full of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so, funny so, that so, that so, even so exists. It, I know. I thought that was hilarious when I read that, the song of derision. I think it was an Inuit tribe that did that. Yeah. So, so, so that's it. You know, this, this idea of, um, uh, of, of being, of hotly policing what, what's known as big shot behavior, um, is, 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 um, very common in, in, in early human, um, groups in, 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 in small societies and was probably been there for, for, for tens of thousands of years. Um, the, 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 the thing about prestige, um, you know, virtue and success status is that it's offered by other people um it's um uh you can't claim it for yourself you can't walk in there and say i i'm this amazing dude love me people don't like you when people do that it bears everyone's backs up and that, and that, and that's a kind of reflexive thing of i mean actually i think in the the country that that, that that puts up with that the most is is the us i always always i always always like the um the cooking you know the cooking competition shows and when you when you watch top chef or the, the chefs are like, I'm the I'm the greatest, I'm amazing. And in the English equivalent master chef, they're going, oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to win. I, I don't, I'm not very good. So yeah, I, th- I think there's some there's some cultural differences there. But still, like, it, it's still in the states, you know, if so, you know, you can't go in and demand everyone loves you. That's not how it works, and we we, we tend to respond very badly to that. Uh, so, so, so yeah, status is always offered, and and I think that's why um in the UK there's a there's a the kind of a, a cultural obsession at the moment with with um prince harry and Meghan markle because and i and i think that the uh, the, 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 the they are I, I think it's fair to say widely disliked by a lot of people in the uk right now and i think a lot of that is down to the fact really? that they are yeah a, a lot of that is down to the fact that they that they seem to have, have afforded themselves a level of a level of status which uh, 
they don't seem to have um, earned. I think that's that's that that's the popular perception, at least amongst the people. But who they're th that's the whole point. They were them. in the royal family, like they never earned that. It was, <laughs> you know, they were, he was born into it, and then he says, "You yeah. know what? I don't want to be a part of this. It's too much of a rat race, and it's making me miserable." And then people go, yeah. "How dare you? What are you too good for the royal family?" And he's like, "That's not really what my point was, people." Right? Well, I, and so I, now I you think, mad at him for that? I, think, I don't know. I don't get it. Well, I think it's I think it's the fact that every game has its rules, you know, and 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 right. if you've ever watched The Crown, you'll know the the big thing about being part of the royal family is it's it's not all that fun. It's it's duty. It's boring stuff. It's opening supermarkets and clubs and shaking hands with mayors and pretending you're interested in what they've got to say. It's pretty. It's a grind. It's it's a lot of work and it's pretty boring. And um, the other thing about the royal family is you're not allowed to have an opinion because you've got to unite the country. You can't divide it. So you can't have political opinions. And so it's tough. It's not easy. And I think the perception here is that that, that he just didn't, he, he just couldn't, he, he rejected all that. So they're fine if you're going to reject that. Then you can't really be taking all this status from being a member of the royal family, which maybe is a little bit. Right. I, I mean, I kind of understand <laughs> that, but also isn't he like, I'm not a member of the royal family anymore or I'm not a royal anymore? I mean, that's like, I don't know. I feel I, it sounds weird to say it, but I feel bad for the guy. Right. Because he basically said, this is freaking me out. I'm having a mental health crisis. And everyone went, how dare you take care of yourself? Right. Yes, how dare I, you I think, do I think, this? He, I, 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 think he, I, th I think if he was taking care of him, was doing that and was just going to go, listen, if he was going to go to the States and get a job, people would have gone, oh, fair enough. But he's completely trading off the fact that he, he's still relying on the royal family for, um, his status for his, for, you know, it's all connected with that. He still calls himself Prince Harry, the Duke of whatever he's the Duke of. Uh, it's oh, still I didn't know that. And, and he's still, and he went on Oprah. Oh, yeah. right? He doesn't work at Safeway. Oh, yeah. He doesn't work at yeah, Spotify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, so, so the only thing is, the only thing, so, so you know, what, what, where's his um, virtue status coming from? Well, he doesn't seem to have, he doesn't seem to have done anything nice for anybody. Where's his competence? Well, he hasn't got any competence. You know, we, we admired him when he was fighting for the British Army in Afghanistan. But where's his competence now? So, so, so I, I think, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to, feel, to come across like I'm a, a massively anti-Harry person. I'm just trying to kind of I was going to say, well, we know this. where you stand on the <laughs> issue. <laughs> Shit, yeah. Will. Yeah, no, but, 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 but no, it's more, of a, it's more of a case of positioning for him. I, I just think he's, you know, I, I, I also admire him for upping and leaving. If you don't want to be in it, brilliant. Go and live in, like, go and live in, the, in Santa Monica. I, I wish I could live in uh -huh. Santa Monica. But 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 or wherever he is, he's, he's in that part of the world, roughly. Isn't yeah, he. he? But, I, but think I think he is like. Right. Yeah, I think he actually is there. You can visit when you go on Joe Rogan. Yeah. You can check it out. But you can go I, and hang I out think, with Harry. Uh, I think um, I, I think he's being badly advised, and 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 I honestly think if he understood a bit more about how status works, then he wouldn't be making a lot of the decisions that he's been making. I think he could, he could be much better advised. What would you do if you were him? This is such a tangent, but I'm so curious. What would you do if you were him? <laughs> like stay out of the limelight, you know that kind of thing. Well, I would the the first thing I would do is um is reduce the um re re reduce the what do you say you re reduce the impression that you are um sourcing all your status from attacking the royal family and and you know we were talking about how you can gain status by pulling other people down and I think that that that's what's been happening a lot, but also I just think it's you know people would just admire him if he just went out and and um and worked. Right, yeah. I think, didn't he get a job at a tech company or something? Yeah, it's all very weird. That He also um, he also um, uh, got, took a deal from Spotify, and I think they've produced half an hour of content right. in, 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 in a year. Yeah, for like $32 so, you know, million dollars or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so all of these things, just, you just think, oh, God, you know, it's not going to play well with the majority of people in the UK who are just working their backsides off and struggling. For, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it's... um. Uh, yeah, uh, if I was him, I'd keep the head down. I'd earn, I'd earn money that wasn't dependent on my royal status, and then, and then, you know, once you've got that separation and got that uh, earned that distance from the royal family, then you can come out with your books and your Oprah and say, you know what, being in the royal family was pretty bad. There was some there was some problems with it. And I think if he'd have waited, and I think if he'd have earned respect before he he could still say everything he's been saying about the racist the racial allegations and the whatever else he's been saying. People would have been much more receptive to it if, he, if he'd have earned that respect rather than rather than just um, assuming that he has it, I think. 
Yeah, that is interesting. That is very interesting. I never thought about this like that, but I, I also am not paying super close attention to it. I assume you're paying more attention to it now. One, you don't you don't have a choice because you live in the UK, but two, you're writing about status. I'd love to hear what you think about. I'd love to hear what you think about cancel culture because that also seems like it's very much about status, right? This is not. Uh, it's not like a. Well, I'll let you go off on this because I. I it, this to me seems like almost like a disguised status play or a thinly disguised status play on all sides. Well, it is. Yeah, I think that's right. And and, and I think one of the most interesting sort of pit, bits of research that I found that just it suddenly made sense of cancel culture in a way that I'd never thought of it before. And that was how um, punishment worked in uh, the tribes that we evolved in. Um, and there was a really interesting fact and in that the tribes that we evolved in didn't usually have leaders that like when you look at the world today, um, where there are leaders everywhere, political leaders, cultural leaders, you know, bosses at work, leaders, you know, we have leaders and we, there are leaders and there are followers. But 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 um, when we evolved, there, 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 there weren't leaders in that way. You know, there, there were high status people, higher status people, but, what, but they would generally lead by consensus and they would generally be. Um, deferred to only in the kind of distinct realm of their specialism. So this isn't in all cases, but it's in, in most cases. So the question then is, OK, so if there's nobody in charge, who decides who gets punished? Because life in these tribes could be pretty rough. Um, if you were if you transgress the rules, you could be executed. And it's believed that um, capital punishment execution was once a human universal. So that that was just how it worked. If you if you if you if you did, got it wrong, y y y there was a chance you were going to get killed. Um, and so what would happen is that um, people would start gossiping about you and um, through that gossip, a kind of consensus would build. And the people that would make the decision on what would happen, they call the, the, the um, um, anthropologists call them the, the, the cousins. And they said we didn't live under the tyranny of leaders. We lived under the tyranny of the cousins. And what happened with the cousins would get together mm -hmm. and they would talk. And, a, and again, a consensus would emerge. And once there was a feeling of consensus in the group and it didn't have to be a literal consensus just a sense that most people um were against this person um they would attack and and often with you know deadly force the, and in the example that i quote in the book the guy's um the guy's done nothing wrong he, he some source a source somebody died in the in the group a sorcerer did um like a, a ceremony with some leaves i think leaves and decided this person was the killer and um, the, 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 so people start gossiping about this person and you know, recounting, you know, what happens with gossip? You, 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 when you recount everybody's, everybody's past sins, they can, cut, they can suddenly seem like a very evil person. And then the guy was um, killed, cooked and eaten. That's what happened to him. You know, as this is in the Gabu Didn't, that yeah, was a, the Gabusi tribe. That and so you, so you see this in cancel quickly. culture. Yeah, well, it did. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and you see that happening with cancel culture. And again, it's another example of the fact that we can't blame Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey from Twitter for creating these things. It, they, they're just enabling people to do what people have been doing for tens of thousands of years. Somebody transgresses the sacred rules of the group. In, in this case, it, you know, it's usually a political group. Uh, a, a group who has got very strong political views about race, gender or trump or any other you know whatever it is that they, that group somebody comes on transgresses their sacred rules and the group kind of you know nobody's in charge of a cancellation there's nobody that says right let's go and do it and then and or nobody can stop it it's this thing that emerges it's this it's the, it, and it emerges in this atmosphere of gossip consensus building and attack um it, it, in exactly the same way that, that it would have worked tens of thousands of years ago and still works in in, in some pre-modern tribes so, so so that's the key for me with cancel culture it's part of the, our basic cognition it's it's what we do um uh and uh so, so, so it's so it's going to be very hard to stop yeah this uh it's not something we can just sort of decide not to do anymore right i mean we are 100 percent wired to do this and so cancel culture is going only going to get worse as we are taking our brains that evolved to work in small groups and pl plugging them into the entire world via the internet overnight like we're not going to be able to adapt to this right and yeah so there was just there are two things i'd say to say about that first one is we might be able to stop it because the the, the, the great thing is about humans is that we can we can always come up with new norms and I do think slowly this is happening. I, th I think the more cancel culture is known, the more it's getting frowned upon, the more it's becoming a more niche idea. It's still very mainstream and people are being cancelled all the time. And, you know, 
it, it's still happening. But 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 I think now that it's be, it's being highlighted, um, um, you know, we, we we can create norms against it. Uh, the, the other thing is that is that is that we can is that we can legislate against it. I mean, you know, in in the US you have free speech. In in Europe we have we don't have free speech, but we have you know effective free speech. It, it's a lesser form of free speech, but 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 speech is protected. Um, uh, or people shouldn't be persecuted for their beliefs, that kind of thing. Um, and and so I, I think I would like to see governments legislating against specifically against cancel culture. I would like to see it, it, you know laws brought in that 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 that, that companies aren't allowed to uh, fire people on the basis of their political beliefs. Uh, or, you know, uh, which that, that so, so so uh, you know, what it, it shouldn't it, it should be made illegal that, that the people should be, um, uh, yeah, um, bullied and well, not bullied, but 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 yeah, removed from their positions of um, uh, income generation because of their political beliefs. I think oh, yeah, I would like to see legislation against that. The victimhood and uh, victimhood and status also play an interesting kind of mixed role here right because we've we've seen this recently faking an event or f exaggerating something or even faking a hate crime to gain victimhood status has happened in many instances i wouldn't say it's an epidemic per se but it does show that the players in this game are not trying to be the most moral they're trying to be the most morally forceful in these specific situations right it's not about who's right it's about who can sort of like signal the hardest at that level yeah yeah, so so when you understand morality as a status game, all of that stuff makes sense. And and it says it's not an epidemic by by any stretch of the imagination, but it's happening. Um, you know, it happens that people fake hate crimes, and you know, um, there there are some examples that I kind of list in the in the book. Um, and uh, and when when you understand morality as 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 actually just a status game, uh, it, that that kind of makes more sense. You know, when we when we become um, when 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 we become um, uh, victims of um, a rival group, um, and um, that can be a kind of status gaining um, 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 situation, because we get loads of attention from people in our group, and and they and they want to help us, and they look at us, and they they raise us up and go, oh, you know, so so victimhood can paradoxically be a kind of state of heroism. And especially if you stand up and go and say, I was attacked by this person, but I'm still standing and I will bring the fight to them. You know, you become brave heart uh, for your group. So that's an incredibly status making um, pursuit. And you also see it in the context of people whose kind of jobs are, or their, 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 their social identities are dependent on these kinds of moral uh, status making um, uh, incidents. So, so, so in the book, I talk about one. Um, I think she was an academic, and she was she, she was doing a speech at a university about hate crime and hate speech. And lo and behold, she left the left the talk, and her um, car had been vandalised with swastikas and um, and the like. And um, um, and it turned out that she did the uh, graffiti herself. The police discovered she she did it all herself. The vandalism. So you can see in that instance that's somebody that 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 her her sense of status depends upon there being horrific racists everywhere. And so she's making it happen that there are horrific. Right? I'm not saying there aren't, uh, you know, but but she's making it happen that this is that this is that, you know, and thereby kind of raising her status. So 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 you can see that as that that kind of yeah. Once you understand that 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 that. that morality virtue is just one way that we gain status for ourselves you understand that kind of the, the the will to be seen as a victim because being a victim can be a very status making thing with our own people who, who are the people that matter right because it causes our sort of tribe to defend us but also the subtext is look how important i am people cared enough to commit crimes against me because of what i'm doing and what i am believing therefore what i'm doing and believing must be so important that it is a threat to the enemy so it, it does it communicates all the right things if you're kind of a shallow status seeking asshole who's willing to lie to people to to gain status in that way well, that's exactly right, and also I think it's, it, it, there's a fundamental thing about this about about storytelling, and and you know every tribe, every person in every tribe that we belong to, every group that we belong to, has stories it tells about the world, um, and you know the stories are replete with heroes and villains, and those stories are never really true; they're always 
gross simplifications of, of 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 the reality you can look at the you know i always think about apple versus pc as a story about how pc people are just um silly nerds and of course that's not that's not wholly true you know it's, uh, but, but these stories make us feel good about ourselves these stories basically say we are high status they're low status so somebody that comes along and and reaffirms that story that we are the good people and they are the racists they're going to get all this status they you know we, you know women are great men are terrible or men are great women are terrible if you if you can, if you can tell your group and present your group with a story from your own life that affirms this i had this terrible thing happen to me that these awful people did to me that that just by reaffirming their simplistic story of the world, you're, you're going to gain status. Is there a way to tell for us to tell what status game we're in and maybe dial it back a little? Because as with many psychological concepts, right, the more we become aware of it, maybe that's the first step anyway into toning it down or letting it affect us a little bit less. Right. Like if I know other people are just trying to gain status by saying horrible things about my work, maybe I take those comments with a bit of a grain of salt instead of thinking like, wow, why am I getting attacked? There must be something wrong with me. It's, well, actually, I'm more visible now. I'm doing everything right with marketing. And of course, there's going to be people who decide to try and take me down a peg because of what we just discussed today. Are there sort of practical exercises that people can do or things people can can keep in mind in order to make this yeah, hurt less, I guess? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I think I think that, as you say, that the first thing is just to know it's just a game, just to remind yourself that it's just a game. And 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 the one I, the, the the one I always think about from the book is is that there's this um island in Micronesia where where the status get their players growing massive yams, and 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 and, and as a result, I don't think they do it anymore. They, they they just have this culture of all the men spend all their lives obsessing over who can grow the biggest yam. And of course, it, it, in their world, that's the most important thing. And they obsess over their yam, their big yam, like I obsess over my writing and you obsess over your podcasts. But it's just a fucking yam. You know, you know, it doesn't actually matter yeah, that much. Yeah. And, and, and especially if it's people like being mean about you on Reddit or whatever, it actually doesn't matter. You know, it's just symbolic. They, they are, as you say, they're just showing off to their group. I'm trying to gain status. Um, the the other thing I think is really is important. You asked about how you can tell what kind of group you're in. And I think it's I think it's it's quite easy in in a sense. So dominance games are um, are, are mafias, armies, um, lawyers play dominance games. You know, you're 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 trying you're you're you're, you're, you're it's a it's a game of force and coercion. So 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 dominance games are, 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 are usually pretty bad places to be. You know, unless you're on sort of a winning army or something. Um, virtue games are about the enforcement of um, kind of moral rules, and so virtue games can be amazing. Charities, you could say, are virtue games because they're you know they they they're, they're doing virtuous things. Um, church, but for churches are virtue games. Ro ro you know, royal families are virtue games. They're not about competence. Royal families they're not about success. They're about deference and enforcing the rules and enforcing the hierarchy and making sure everyone's performing the ritual correctly. Um, and success games um, are businesses. They're scientific endeavors. Success games are those games you play that have a specific, they've specific, they have a specific definition of what success looks like. And it isn't just winning. It's we're going to write a best-selling book. We're going to um, create a coronavirus vaccine with no side effects. It's it, it's that. Uh, and so. Um, you know, success games really have transformed the world. When you think about modernity, when you think about how the world has become post, you know, the Industrial Revolution was a revolution of success games. It, it was a revolution in the sense that we stopped playing virtue games and we, 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 start, we started caring much less about caste, social background, all that other stuff. And we, started, we, and we started playing games of who can create, who can build the best bridge, you know, who can create the best internal combustion engine, you know, and that, that, that's modernity. It, it's about success games. And I think the, 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 probably that if you want to sort of change the world for the better, you don't, paradoxically, you don't play virtue games. You don't really want to go and be a priest. What you want to do is you want to um, play a success game. And, and and if you really want to change the world, you want to play a, a you know, because there are no kind of pure games. Every game has a, is a blend of all of those different um, forms of status. And I think of I think the very best games are, vir are virtue success games. So so if you think of a, a cancel culture mob, that's a virtue dominance game. They're the worst games because they're, they're about people forcing you to adhere to the rules with with threat and pain and punishment. That's cancel culture. That's 
Hitler, that's the Nazis, that, that, that's all of that stuff that we don't like, that's, the, that's Stalin. Virtue dominance games are the worst. But virtue success games are, we are going to use our competence to increase good. So a charity is a virtue success game. Somebody running a marathon, you know, for uh, lung cancer or breast cancer or prostate cancer is playing a virtue success game. Um, Somebody working for a pharmaceutical company, assuming they're not one of these people that are charging $1,000 for an asthma inhaler, uh, are playing a virtue. You know, the people who design the coronavirus vaccines are playing a virtue success game. You know, we've got this successful end game, um, but it's for a virtuous end. So I think those are the kind of very, the very best games. Uh, so there's advice at the end of the book. And there's seven rules for playing a status game. And I think two of the most important ones are the first one is um, reduce your moral sphere. So, and by that, I mean, is that you know, as you've been sort of mentioning throughout the, our conversation, it's just really easy to make ourselves feel good by tearing other people down. It's really easy to turn on television, to go on Twitter or Reddit or Facebook and make ourselves, our relative status increase by pulling other people down. And so, you know, reducing your moral sphere is, is just sort of consci- consciously trying to catch yourself when you're morally judging other people and really try and focus that moral judgment into yourself. How can I be a better person rather than how can I make myself feel better by negative, negging out and attacking all these other people? And, and a more practical one is, is about kind of ways of being, really. And when you look at the literature um, uh, on... Um, um how people should present in order to succeed in life um i i i kind of they, 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 there are kind of mixed signals in that literature but the ones that make sense for the status game are warmth sincerity and competence like if you can show warmth sincerity and competence you're going to win at life and that's because when you're warm you um are you are implying i am not going to play a dominance game with you you're not going to get any threats from me i like you you're in a safe place you know, I'm not going to start attacking you or threatening you. So that's dominance. Um, sincerity um, is, you know, I'm uh, I'm going to level with you. So sincerity isn't just being nice. It's being, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you when things are going badly and I'm going to tell you when things are going well. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to um, um, be kind of morally unfair to you. And then of course, competence is just success. I'm going to be, I'm going to be useful to the group. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to show skill and you're going to you, you, you might learn some skills from me and together we're going to increase the status of our of our group. And so so warmth, sincerity and competence to me is that this kind of magic triumvirate that, that, that I think, of course, easier said than done. But but I, but I think as a, as a goal to aim for, if you want to win in the status game of life, those are the three qualities which we should be working on. Well, thank you very much for your time. I wish you all the success in the world with the book. And, and may you grow the largest yam among all of the other writers in your neighborhood. <laughs> thank you, and you, Jordan. I wish you uh, 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 the, 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 the largest yam in the world of podcast making. Thank you so much for the great chat and for engaging with the book. I really appreciate that.